Tell me when you. Okay, so hello everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, third uh, online symposium, Philosophers on Eating. That uh, this one is devoted to food waste. So I'm Andrea Borghini, and I'll just briefly introduce uh, our guest speakers and the event. So uh, before doing that, I'll just uh, repeat briefly uh, some information about Culinary Mind, which is a center for the philosophy of food based at the University of Milan that connects food scholars all over the world. And these online symposia are meant to be original conversations over eating and consumption in the spirit of the center, you know, so is, which is to bring together voices from different philosophical perspectives and also disciplines on food related issues. So we promote an interdisciplinary approach and we're very happy to have with us today so many experts. Um, so let me introduce the three guest speakers and uh, the discussion leader uh, that uh, joined us uh, today. So the first person to speak is uh, going to be Rachel Vaughn, who's a lecturer at uh, the UCLA Biotechnology Cluster and is right. coordinator of the Coronavirus Multi-Species Reading Group at the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization. Her research focuses on food waste, methods of high-tech, low-tech, and no-tech waste metabolism and revalue, studying how those topics intersect with social structures such as class, gender, and race. She's now working on two books, one which is for the University of Nebraska Press called Talking Food, Talking Trash, Oral Histories of Food Precarity from the Margins of a Dumpster, and a second book under contract with Ohio State University Press entitled Queer Toxic Soybeans and Estrogen Panic, Gender Food Fear Mongering. So the second speaker instead is uh, Paul Thompson, who's a professor of philosophy and holds the uh, Kellogg Chair in Agriculture, Food and Community Ethics at Michigan State University. He received his PhD from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. And during his career, he made significant contributions on a number of topics, including food ethics, sustainability, environmental philosophy, philosophy of technology, pragmatism, and bioethics. He's the author of over 200 scholarly work, and among them, we may mention The Spirit of the Soil and From Field to Fork, Food Ethics for Everyone, as well as The Agrarian Vision. And the third speaker is Catherine Alexander, who's professor of anthropology at Durham University. She carried out fieldwork in Turkey, Kazakhstan, and Britain, mainly on changing relations between state, market, and the third sector, most recently in the context of waste and recycling, including ideas of thrift. Her books on waste include Economies of Recycling, published in 2012, and Indeterminacy, Waste, Value, and Imagination, published in 2019. Thrift and its paradoxes is out next year. In 2020, she co-edited a special issue on waste and its disguises. The discussion, as I mentioned, uh, is led by uh, another uh, scholar who's joined us today is Andrew Chignell, who's Lawrence uh, Rockefeller Professor in the University Center for Human Values at Princeton. And he has also appointments in the philosophy and religion departments there. He received his PhD at Yale University and given seminal contributions to the study of Kant, philosophy of religion, and the ethics of belief, among others. Uh, his publications on food ethics include uh, the editing of the volume Philosophy Come to Dinner, co-edited with Terence Cuneo and Matthew Haltman for Routledge. Um, so before we begin, uh, I'll uh, remind that uh, each speech will last about 25 minutes. Um, they will follow one another. And during the presentations, all the participants are invited to submit questions or comments through the Zoom chat function. Obviously, of course, questions can be asked also during the discussion too, and Andrew will moderate these. Um, we will take a short break after the presentations and then come back for the discussion. So I'll leave the word now to Andrew, who's chairing these, and thanks again for uh, joining us today. Uh, Andrew, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Can everybody hear me? Great. Well, uh, Andrea made my job very easy by doing all the introductions and telling everybody how it's all going to work. So I think um, for me, there's nothing left to do at this point except to 
hand it over to uh, our first speaker, who is, again, Rachel Vaughn from UCLA, speaking on food waste and troubling the circular economy. And I think she's going to share some slides. So take it away, Rachel. Oops. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much for organizing. And can everyone see that? Okay. So I want to um, speak with you all today about this uh, topic that I've been um, uh, digging into a little bit more as I complete uh, a book project. And I want to um, start with an introduction, a, a provocation, uh, an object lesson, if you will. Um, and then I'll go through three parts with you all today, a general sort of research overview of what I'm working on and how I'm thinking about circularity. Um, talking a little bit more about troubling circular economies, and then part three, thinking a little bit more together about edible design. So I begin with uh, a provocation. And of all things, I'm going to use the humble kitchen sponge. So staring intently at the sponge aisle in a local supermarket, I find myself enveloped in a tiny world of vivid colors an array of synthetic marigold yellows, olive greens, cloying bubblegum pinks, all amassed on countless shelves. Each is cocooned in a sheath of plastic, mostly PET-1, PP-5, uh, polypropylene, and PVC-3, polyvinyl chloride. Each a colorful pillow made of a tangle of plastic polymers and polyethylene tetraphthalate that will never completely disintegrate, each uh, a love letter sized lesson in the idealization of a clean home, clean sink, clean life. Each is an arsenal in miniature set aside for the daily, often ignored labor for squeaky clean pots, scrubbed pans and plates that serve every gastronomic whim, all to later be wiped away with a satisfying squish or a squelch and the clatter of dishes set out to dry. Here in this forgotten corner of the supermarket lie tools for grappling with eating's ultimate demise and food waste's last gasps into the compost bin. I can almost hear the din of my stepson play fighting in the living room. In guardia patatalessa, fetta di salame amufita, he shouts. On guard, that means you boiled potato, you stinky old piece of moldy salami. He's very uh, creative <laughs> with his insults. Here, an aisle of objects through which quotidian food waste battles may be fought, perhaps even momentarily won. But what then of the older, smellier, more microbially laden, war-torn versions of these synthetic unrendering brethren in battle? None of these are truly biodegradable. They're made of forever chemicals and additives. Hidden away on a lower shelf, one claims compostability, though some cellulose sponges blend synthetics or are treated with chemicals, none are edible. Could sponges even be edible? Would consumers actually gulp, consume them if they were? We certainly don't, do not expect objects like a kitchen sponge to be edible and only some are compostable by design. It is this object lesson of the sponge that will not die among other exemplary food waste packaging afterlives that I use as provocation with you today. These are useful objects for us to ponder in relation to circular economies and food waste's role in idealizations of circularity because they challenge tastes, they challenge conveniences and perhaps provoke consideration of what circularity might necessitate, what daily reimaginings and reformations might actually need to occur. My scholarship at the intersections of the field of food and discard studies has long tussled with questions like this about the very limits of edibility and of capitalism. And with whether or not sustainable communities are the same as more just communities. 
I'm completing a book about trash, uh, an exploration of acts of food salvage, food redistribution, and what some interviewees call picking through storytelling. It's an analysis of a microcosm reflecting a macro issue. The act of food revalue from the margins of a dumpster can be framed in extremes as either a criminal or as an act of destitution or the work of righteous privileged food warriors. But in doing this oral history and ethnographic research, I discovered that diving for food recovery is a means to very differing ends, wherein hungry people procure food, subcultural movements like freeganism seek to challenge waste levels in the US and, and elsewhere, local level projects redistribute or divert surplus foods to those in need, just like in this uh, image, I'm, this third image I'm showing you, which is a, a photo from a redistribution project, a gift program, a mutual aid project in uh, Mercato di uh, Porta Palazzo in Torino. Um, and working people supplement and cobble together useful resources in times of struggle much like uh, is represented by this interviewee who was an aluminum scavenger and had experienced homelessness. In this work, the dumpster comes alive as a resource utilized for multiple and complex reasons. It is also a political and anxiety ridden space revealing the intentional role of surplus within neoliberal production models and the juxtaposition between desirability of consumerism in tension with the disgust that late capitalism generates. This manifests sometimes as disgust for the very space of the dumpster uh, or even proximity to it. Disgust for items considered old, ugly, imperfect, and therefore rendered discardable, or perhaps as many of my interviewees articulated, it manifests as disgust for a system that is predicated on surplus and waste rather than sharing sufficiency, equal access and well-being to begin with. Examining the many reasons people do food recovery shows us how precarity is shamed and also how privilege functions materially through waste. As this research progressed, I began to ask questions like, how do communities talk about food waste if they talk about it at all? When and if food salvage becomes palatable, how is that achieved? Who does that benefit? And in what context does food recovery become normalized? And when is it shamed or criminalized? And I think a great kind of juxtaposition of these two things would be like when, when celebrity chefs do this, here's an example, you know, Massimo Bottura has, you know, um, done this work of food recovery to great, to great uh, uh, praise. Um, but we might juxtapose that against this headline from the Oregonian from uh, February of this year in which police were called um, to guard the dumpsters of a local supermarket um, against residents who were trying to make use of it. So beyond acts of food salvage, the matter of food waste itself is rich with possibilities, it's microbially teeming with life, um, and yet it also is presented as a moral quandary, an object around which to frame good citizenship through uh, the yardstick of ideal consumption trends. Quote, don't be a bad apple. British people waste up to 50% of food they buy, declares one public service announcement, for instance. Food waste is regularly defined as an individual household conundrum to be fixed and managed rather than a systemic outcome or supply chain problem and addressing food waste on an individual level and household level becomes the duty of so-called moral citizens, good mothers, careful parents, outlining middle-class and gendered ideals or aesthetics of achieving sustainability through right consumption or what Christine Harold has called, quote, mindful minimalism movements promoting abstinence or at least restraint um, in their book, Things Worth Keeping, or what Catherine McKendrick uh, refers to as precautionary consumerism, wherein consumers who are, who are able to mitigate uh, their own exposure risks through purchasing power uh, do so uh, in what she calls an absence of precautionary policies. And here you have some images of, from the, e, the EPA. They're sort of reducing waste in the home tips page. There's lots of tips pages um, like this on food waste in America. And then certainly the imagery of the zero waste home is, um, is quite prevalent. Um, yet that complicated range of the 30 to 40% of overall food systems loss data, uh, data in the US 
represents uh, a very normalized outcome of food systems that are permissibly, unjustly, and proprietarily sometimes wasteful by design uh, of low wage labor, of resources as well, of chemicals, of water, of life. My book examines the meaning making that's happening at the edges of the dumpster, but I'm not uh, interested in defining how to live so-called better, cleaner, or more ecologically or more moral lives through recycling and salvaging or by way of what Alexis Shotwell has called the pursuit of purity. I wanna transition now to think a little bit more about that research and related to circular economies and, and troubling circular economies. So food waste is increasingly studied, quantified and reimagined within circular economic models. This is an image from the uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation and Milano Food Policy Council of the role of food waste and conceptualizations of circular development. Social scientist Federico Savini defines it as, quote, a variegated set of practices for transitioning towards a sustainable socioeconomic system, like use of organic waste, such as biomass or biogas, or innovative product design to facilitate recycling. And it is most clearly defined in opposition to the linear economy based on make, use, dispose, consumption paradigms. While this concept of circularity is not new, it is increasingly idealized in global corporate models, featuring what Savini pins points as, quote, a regime of accumulation in which waste is treated as not an output to manage, but a resource for economic development. In this model, difficulties and problems are framed as new solutions, levying validity and revalue to otherwise problematic materials that must somehow be managed. Small scale food waste redistribution projects, such as my interviewees in Torino from that photo earlier at Porta Palazzo, or uh, much bigger food waste to biogas goals that are being outlined here in Milano, for example, are reflective of some facets of this, but to very differing degrees. The undervalued, the rotten and lifeless is afforded new meanings, desirability, potential. Household and individual consumer habits are here again though, very much centered and consumption is crucial and necessary. What waste scholar Alice Ma has called quote, the paradox of circular development that doesn't actually give up on unsustainable growth. Proponents emphasize the dire need to reimagine systems and infrastructures to meet net zero emissions goals, especially shorter and more interconnected supply chains in which the revalue of commodities is prolonged for as long as possible within loops of reuse, redistribution and technological reinvention. Critiques of this model though are likewise crucial, especially concerning exaggerations uh, about what food waste to biogas scholars Tora Holberg and Malin Eidland have called the neatness of circularity. As Savini uh, aptly notes, and actually I'll pause here and say, if you, you know, want to look at some other uh, insightful critiques of circular economies, um, there are so many that I think are critical for those of us who study waste and study food and study food waste uh, to, to consider, you know, from health concerns to recycling for recycling workers like biogas explosions and plastic recycling explosions to the mythos of clean recycling and emissions uh, concerns for residents, environmental justice dynamics uh, in the communities that bear the brunt of these exposures, the smellscapes, the limitations to the number of, of recycling loops racism and sexism in agriculture that may create uh, further barriers for farmers and ag workers, impediments to scale, infrastructure. There are many I think we should, um, should consider as we move forward um, with, these, uh, with these policies wherever we may be in the world. Um, as Savini has aptly noted, rather than an explicit anti-capitalist focus in which consumption is disrupted first and foremost, or market logics and fossil fuel industry subsidies questioned, Quote, waste instead becomes the wellspring of economic production and consumption, a source of materials, a posteriori uh, justified as a strategy for meeting climate targets in a growing post-industrial economy. They justify a vicious codependency in which waste accumulation and material energy supply bypasses the more fundamental source of ecological problems, which is ever-growing consumer capitalism.
the low tech or no tech dynamics that surfaced during my own oral history research with divers and, and salvagers and local redistributors revealed an important spectrum of desire uh, for and for and frustration with circularity. Not all interviewees outlined goals of say, quote, stopping the waste stream as one person put it, though they all salvaged food, reusable objects, resale or barter materials and scrap for exchange. Some found intense meaning in circular economic policy and others express profound wariness for the underlying capitalist goals espoused by mainstreamed modeled, even while acknowledging the importance of reuse, shortened supply chains, and emphasis on small scale community level initiatives. Salvage and revalue as acts of capitalist refusal, gifting or as mutual aid for interview, uh, or as mutual care are interview examples that came up that stand out as explicit disruptions to growth model logics of food waste desirability in this new um, global uh, model of circularity that's being proposed more and more. This also permits then a question to re uh, a return to that question I framed earlier, what makes reuse palatable and when? So I wanna use this question to transition to this last segment on edibility in products for which ingestion might prove to be socially entirely unpalatable. So food waste is increasingly central to circular models for redistribution, energy supplementation, and in biotechnological redesign initiatives from edible utensils or containers to edible food packaging, from food wrapped in food to plastic bags rendered tasty as in this video, which is from Avani Bioplastics um, that is apparently safe for animal consumption. In the final chapter of my book, I explore small scale object instances of what I call redesigning for ingestion, informed by Samantha McBride's insights on what she calls extended producer responsibility, uh, Anna Tseng's work on blasted landscapes, Alexa Shotwell's work on purity politics, and Lisa Dolan's work on the hauntology of waste that is unruly, waste that is unmanageable and that becomes us. In tandem with mountains of primary scientific data proving the porousness of our bodies in relation to waste streams, I began to wonder what edible circular logics might look like in everyday food waste products reimagined, such as plastic packaging, or uh, perhaps to come full circle today, a regular old kitchen sponge. Waste is never truly out of sight, as Tom Davies has reminded us, and always already makes its way into food, soils, waterways, bloodstreams, guts, even breaking the placental barrier. This is not then an exercise in purity politics because I think we can simply techno science or buy our way out of the porous facets of waste and unjust environmental exposures through so-called purer products. On the contrary, I'm interested in the idea of edibility in food waste related products to understand the fictions and limitations of the presumed, I'll use that word again, neatness of circularity as green capitalism to explore a safe enough to eat producer responsibility and as a means of reapproximating to the privilege of assumed awayness of waste. When assigned to analyze design technologies that reimagine plastic food packaging as entirely edible, not just uh, compostable, but edible, many of my UCLA biotechnology students were uncomfortable as they expressed enthusiasm, even as they expressed enthusiasm for zero waste imaginings. They talked about the products in some of the, using some of the following terms. They said unsanitary. They talked about them as dubious or dangerous, maybe uh, inventive, but not culturally appropriate. In short, many couldn't imagine an eaterly world that was safe and convenient, at least for consumers uh, in this stakeholder sense, or in this stakeholder case, without food packaging. Edibility here challenges social orders of taste, yet these are the very questions of convenience and producer polluter responsibility that a more just circularity must also confront. <clears throat> 
Circular economy proponents want to manage and streamline waste through green capitalism and recycling. But we who study discard and metabolism also know that waste is unjust, it's messy, it's complex, it's intentional. That biogas, for instance, requires pricey infrastructure, has emissions or fermented explosion concerns and smellscapes that affect lives, or that recycling falls far short in worker protections and community health in emissions, in sheer processing percentage and looping capacities. Consumers in the global north are encouraged to buy purer products that, um, that render waste more palatable when thrown away because waste is a massive boon for development. Pondering edibility in products that are unexpected, something like packaging or even the humble kitchen sponge here, may leave some eaters extremely uncomfortable as we saw with my students. This is food recovery and circularity that is not palatable in a social sense. Perhaps edibility proposes taste-based implications and inconveniences that are uneasy. A 2021 documentary on the dirty failing business of recycling in the US asks, quote, what happens when there is no next person to pass the responsibility of our waste off to? Here in America, we generate the most waste per capita in the world. Waste is messy and leaky. Circularity is not streamlined. Its conception must trouble the waters of capitalism and disrupt extraction and consumption in the first place, as so many before me have argued. I'm not saying circularity shouldn't exist or that it always fails, but I do wonder though, how centering edibility, not just compostability in design as just one just one example of a uh, producer imperative might extend producer responsibility or challenge privileged consumers to sit with and stay uncomfortable about the waste being made in the global north. Um, how it might push us to see, sure, uh, some forms of waste as teeming with modest met metabolic possibilities while also confronting and troubling the limits of growth in the circular economy. And I will leave it there. Excellent. And I will and clap. Off to my colleagues. <laughs> audibly while others clap inaudibly. Um, Thanks, everybody. Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, next, we're switching the order a little bit and we'll turn to Paul Thompson of Michigan State and then have Catherine Alexander after that. So, Paul's speaking on upstream impact of food waste reduction. What are the ethical questions? Okay, sharing my screen here. Um, I'm going to uh, organize this uh, presentation around the idea of, uh, or the metaphor of a farm gate. Uh, this is something that uh, we talk about in agriculture quite a bit, but basically the idea is that on one side, of the farm gate, you have the farm. There are also seed companies and things like that, but I'll mostly be focusing on the farm. Whereas on the other side of the farm gate, you have things like uh, grain companies and uh, uh, food processors and manufacturers. Uh, and then finally, as you move down the chain, you have the parts of the food system that are more visible to uh, most of us, to the ordinary people, sort of ending up with the trash can, which is how I think uh, uh, many people think of uh, waste and uh, where I think some of the uh, targets for ethical discussion of reducing uh, food waste have, uh, have really um, emphasized. What I'm going to do in my presentation today, I'll, I'll note first that there are actually losses at every stage. And in some respects, I'm uh, investigating this question as to whether we should think of them as waste, uh, particularly uh, as they relate, relate to uh, the things that are happening above the farm gate. Uh, I really want to talk about two problems in what I'm calling upstream food waste here. Uh, and uh, the first one uh, really has to do uh, with this sense that uh, if we're going to reduce the need for farm commodities, that is, if we're going to consume more of that food on our plate, find ways to reuse it, find ways to uh, cut down on the the unneeded, unconsumed parts of food in retail and at every stage, uh, it's going to have effects on the other side of the farm gate, uh, 
uh, it's actually going to reduce the opportunity to sell farm commodities, and this will have a negative effect on farm income. Uh, perhaps this is uh, uh, just uh, an obvious point, uh, but I do think that it has uh, ethical significance in that um, the smallholders in the food system are going to have less ability to cope with this fluctuation in prices that comes about as, uh, as uh, reducing consumer waste uh, reduces the need for agricultural commodities. And so they'll be the ones that actually bear uh, the brunt of these reductions uh, in demand. Now you might think of this as well, you know, what's the, what's, what's the big deal here? You know, if we uh, do a better job of recycling our aluminum cans, uh, that's going to have an effect on uh, mining. And uh, if we get more efficient automobiles, it's gonna reduce the demand for oil. So, so what's significant here ethically? Uh, and uh, I think uh, in many respects, I'd start with just the, uh, what, what perhaps is the obvious fact it's a key focus uh, in my book, uh, From Field to Fork, uh, which is that uh, these farm producers we're talking about uh, don't look very much like uh, Exxon or Mobil or, uh, or even um, uh, Alcoa, these giant corporations. These are uh, even, even uh, relatively large farmers in the US are uh, relatively weak economically compared to them, but in fact, uh, something on the order of 50 to 70 percent of the world's population who live in extreme poverty today are farmers. And so we're actually talking about an uh, impact on a population uh, that is already significantly disadvantaged as a whole. Uh, and uh, if we have any instincts towards distributive justice, uh, we ought to be uh, concerned about these impacts uh, strictly because they are uh, affecting smallholders who are economically weak and already uh, having a serious uh, difficulties meeting uh, their demands, right? So in a nutshell, waste reduction on the consumer side may raise these issues of distributive justice on the far side of the farm gate. Now, I want to dig a little bit more deeper into this by examining how this uh, interacts with uh, some waste reduction arguments. And certainly in the world that I live in, which is much more tied to the agriculture side, uh, the key perspective on this is actually focused on projected food needs uh, in 2050. 2050 is the man magic number uh, that shows up in studies by the Food and Ag Organization of the United Nations and by uh, uh, various uh, agricultural ministries uh, around the world. And what's driving this argument, the reason why we need to reduce food waste is uh, uh, that looking out towards 2050, uh, we actually see continued population growth. If I sort of mark this out uh, so that we see uh, the um, space between where we are today and 2050, and then look at uh, what the projected growth in population, uh, we get some sense that there's actually a baked in need for increased food availability. So how do we get that? Well, we could try to increase uh, uh, agricultural production, and there are certainly um, efforts underway to do that. Uh, but if we can reduce this baked in need by uh, reducing the amount of food that is wasted, uh, then that would be part of the picture for uh, continuing to meet world food needs in 2050. Uh, I'll also note that uh, this uh, uh, would also be larger if there is a shift to greater meat consumption. And certainly in some of the world's industrializing economies, we've seen a very dramatic uh, increase in meat production, not everywhere, but uh, uh, China would be the, the primary example. Uh, also, uh, another key part of this argument is that uh, in an era of climate change, uh, we actually expect to see um, uh, differential impacts on crop yields, the green shaded areas in this map, which is from 2010, uh -huh. Uh, expect to actually see some increases in crop yields. Uh, the pink and red, the dark red are dramatic uh, reductions. And uh, two points to note, one of which is that um, maybe not obvious in the map, but uh, there actually is an expectation that on a global basis, uh, there will be negative impact on uh, crop yields. And uh, second point to note, perhaps more ethically significant is that this impact will be uh, felt primarily in those regions that I was talking about earlier, where we have uh, smallholder uh, producers who are uh, 
uh, already uh, quite challenged. So uh, I guess the official view uh, is something like this. Uh, this uh, waste reduction on the consumption side is only going to compensate for significant population growth uh, and uh, the growing demand for food. So I think there has been a tendency among the economists and the agronomists who are engaged in a lot of this work from an agriculture side uh, to see this as kind of a wash uh, as, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as, as waste uh, not having a significant effect. But I think this is inadequate from an ethics perspective precisely because uh, from the perspective of the smallholders that I'm holding up as uh, some of the primarily affected uh, parties, uh, this, these are long-term effects and uh, they basically have to uh, stay alive uh, month to month, year to year. Uh, and uh, what happens 30 years out uh, is uh, meaningless to them if they um, either are forced to uh, exit farming um, and become part of the urban poor or um, uh, have even more uh, dramatically um, dire consequences. So, uh, you know, slightly more sophisticated version of this argument, we, we need to have a kind of meantime view, uh, which is uh, as consumers are reducing their uh, production, we could encourage farmers to plant less. Um, and uh, getting back to this idea that there are uh, some differences between agriculture and mining or manufacturing or uh, the automobile industry or the energy industry, uh, there are some characteristics of agriculture that make uh, reducing production, reducing waste more complex. Uh, some of this was uh, uh, explored in an extremely uh, boring book from 1972. Uh, and I'm going to take some liberties with the argument uh, and characterize it as the too much zucchini argument. If uh, you live in uh, uh, temperate parts of the Northern hemisphere around this time of year, and you have a home garden, uh, you're probably uh, producing a lot more zucchini than you can eat or that you can bake into bread. And so you're hauling it into the office to give to friends. Uh, but of course, everybody who's got a home, uh, a home garden is doing the same thing. And there's just too much zucchini, right? Um, you know, the, it, it's, uh, uh, it's partly a factor of weather. Um, you know, some years there wouldn't be enough zucchini, some years there's too much. Uh, but there is a more basic kind of problem here, which is that uh, farmers really can't make decisions to produce less once the growing season is underway. They plant so many acres, they plant so much seed, they can make decisions to increase their production. They can add more fertilizer, uh, they can spend more time weeding, uh, but uh, there's really nothing that they can do that sort of reduces this baked in um, level of production that they, uh, decisions that they make at the beginning of the season. So there's a tendency, there's a kind of underlying tendency in agriculture to always see um, decision making push towards uh, greater production uh, and very they have very limited means uh, you know they can't um, you know lay off workers and uh, cancel orders or put inventory into storage uh, in ways that other industries can actually adjust their production to declines in demand. Uh, so this has actually come to uh, produce a view among agricultural insiders that Excess production is just part of agriculture. It isn't really wasteful. Um, and so uh, we just need to see agriculture uh, as uh, trapped in this uh, continuing um, surge of overproduction. Uh, so one thing that I think is critical in terms of thinking about consumer waste reduction um, activities is that they aren't necessarily going to translate into a reduction in production at the commodity level. And if we look at the history of what's happened over the last hundred years, uh, the farm sector has constantly found new ways to sell products. Uh, they uh, were producing too much corn, so they decided to turn it into high fructose sweeteners. Uh, they uh, were producing too, much, uh, too many soybeans and other grains, so they started feeding it to animals. Uh, when they couldn't sell all of that, they started converting it into biofuels. Uh, so we just see this kind of uh, push to constantly uh, find ways to use up this excess production in agriculture. Uh, but again, I don't actually think this addresses the ethical point. Um, as an ethicist, uh, 
um, I'm kind of constantly uh, cautioning my colleagues who see this as not really a problem uh, in saying that uh, these are economy-wide effects and they uh, don't necessarily uh, translate well to the small-scale producers. Now, one slight modification of this is to go back to the early years of the uh, Great Depression uh, when this notion of agricultural subsidies was developed. And uh, this was seen as a government solution to the distributive justice issues that arise when you're trying to match farm production to consumer food needs. I'm not gonna talk at length about this, but one of the architects of a, as a young economist right out of grad school uh, was uh, uh, Willard Cochran, uh, who later became the chief economist in the Kennedy administration. Uh, but uh, Cochran came to uh, doubt the effectiveness of these subsidies uh, because he says they basically just reduce the downside risk of overplanting. You're, you're sure you're going to be able to sell everything you produce uh, when there's a subsidy program. Uh, so they actually uh, exacerbate this basic problem. Um, so um, we, we really have a very structural problem with overproduction on one side of the farm gate uh, and uh, uh, things that happen on the consumer side can redound to having effects on producers, but it's not clear that they actually address the waste problem from the standpoint of total production. The second problem I wanna talk about is uh, a, a sense in which people on that side of the farm gate uh, do see, or at least could be made to see uh, a waste problem. Uh, and that is, uh, um, uh, first I'll note that uh, I, I tended, have, in my earlier work, I noted that if you talk to many farmers, uh, when what they see as wasteful is some land that's not in production. Um, but uh, we have, I think, come to the view that uh, uh, there are sometimes better uses of land, even land that potentially could be put into production. Uh, and so we're starting to talk about ways of, uh, keeping land out of production to protect biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, but uh, I wanna, in this presentation, go back to uh, um, Marx, um, who noted an overlooked meaning of waste. Marx talked about the metabolic rift, uh, and I'm going to uh, explain what this is without actually referencing Marx very much. Um, he was writing at a time when uh, there were evident crises in soil fertility, uh, and uh, I will talk about that from the perspective of a historian, uh, Stephen Stoll. Uh, I recommend this particular book uh, quite highly. So Stoll starts with this basic idea that there's a nutrient cycle in agricultural production, uh, actually in plant and animal uh, consumption generally. Uh, but on farms, this uh, basically worked by uh, growing crops, uh, feeding crops to animals, uh, having the animal waste uh, uh, circulated back into the soils uh, and much of the history of agriculture uh, from, I guess, around uh, uh, 1500 up to 1900 uh, was really focused on methods that uh, improved this uh, um, and improved the uptake through use of legumes, long story, which I will not go into. Uh, Stoll starts his story uh, in the uh, latter 1700s, focusing on the United States. Uh, and uh, he notices that uh, uh, many farmers are abandoning these well understood principles of nutrient cycling. Uh, they're called skimmers. They just go in and take that virgin soil and overproduce uh, for a while, and then they abandon their farms uh, and head west. Um, now, at this period in history, this was not seen so much as an environmental history uh, issue as it was a kind of social issue because these skimmers. Uh, would sort of come in, but they wouldn't stick around and support the community. So these rural communities were struggling to survive from a socioeconomic standpoint. But I am going to focus on the environmental uh, crisis. Um, and it started to become uh, significant uh, at about the time that uh, this uh, industry of, uh, of bagging guano uh, um, for use as fertilizer started to develop in the early years of the 19th century. Um, this uh, guano was produced from massive deposits of uh, bird and bat wastes, a different sense of waste. It was discovered that these are not wasteful after all. Uh, and uh, they were sold uh, to farmers globally um, and who had, uh, following the skimmers, abandoned some of these uh, 
uh, well-known practices to conserve soil fertility uh, by cycling nutrients. And uh, farmers became just sort of accustomed to this idea of buying soil fertility by the bag. Um, however, uh, at the time that Marx is writing, uh, this endless supply of guano was becoming depleted. Um, and uh, Marx uh, argued that just like the factory owner, uh, who's ignoring the biological needs of the worker, these capitalist farmers are ignoring the biological needs of the soils. Um, and uh, so uh, this idea that there are metabolic needs uh, of people who work, they need to be uh, fed, they need to be able to reproduce their bodies, uh, is actually reproduced at an environmental level uh, through the metabolic uh, needs of the soil. Uh, and this is what Marx meant by uh, the uh, metabolic rift is, quote, an irreparable rift in the interdependent processes of social metabolism. So uh, this uh, sort of didn't become a problem uh, for agriculture because uh, by the early years of the 20th century, the Haber-Bosch process was delivering nutrients in a bag on an industrial scale. Uh, and uh, so people stopped worrying about the and metabolic rift. I could note uh, that, of course, the uh, use of these synthetic uh, fertilizers is actually one of the drivers for climate change, uh, but I will not dwell on that point. And we'll move right on to uh, the question of whether or not we've actually addressed this question of nutrient cycle. Uh, we still don't have any shortage of synthetic fertilizers, but I would argue that we haven't really avoided the metabolic rift, and we should be asking ourselves what happens to the nutrients we feed to animals uh, and whether they go back into the soils. Uh, in fact, this is uh, what's often happening to those nutrients. They're becoming concentrated at levels that can't possibly be uh, converted back into the soils. And in the meanwhile, uh, the food that's being produced is uh, uh, being shipped uh, too far from the soils where the crops were produced to possibly cycle. Uh, here's a couple of maps to sort of illustrate this, uh, showing you where in the United States, the primary areas for both the corn and soybean production are. And if we look at where uh, meat production occurs, there's actually not a terrible fit with respect to pork production. Pork production mostly happens in areas that overlap with some of the key areas of grain production. Uh, as we shift over to feedlot beef production, uh, we see that uh, uh, there's a very definite westward shift. So that means the grain that is being fed to these animals is being loaded onto rail cars and transported to uh, an area uh, where the animals are being raised and none of the nutrients uh, that are in that grain are uh, able to be recycled back into the soils. Uh, this becomes even more dramatic when we look at uh, chicken uh, meat production. Uh, and a couple of quick things to sort of uh, uh, give you a sense of how this looks on a global basis. Um, we've got uh, uh, um, needs to ship uh, grain to uh, meat producers um, in uh, Europe. Um, the little uh, graphic over there on the right focuses on the United Kingdom, uh, which produces a lot and feeds a lot more uh, grain to animals for beef. Uh, than it can possibly uh, produce. Uh, so we actually have a fairly broad metabolic rift uh, that exists in global agriculture today. Um, so I want to actually suggest that this misfit between grain and meat production is an enormous waste of nutrients, uh, which actually in contemporary production become pollutants. Um, and uh, I would, at least for me, this would be uh, one of the key ethical issues uh, that, uh, that, that the need to reduce waste uh, needs to address on the far side of the farm gate. Um, however, I would say that uh, this isn't really part of the conversation that I'm hearing on consumer waste reduction. And in fact, uh, none of the things that are being discussed that would address, address consumer uh, waste uh, have uh, any kind of uh, positive effects on the metabolic rift. In fact, in Michigan, I don't know how broadly this has been, but uh, there's actually been an attempt to push back on uh, suggestions that uh, we could address waste by improving our, comp our composting. Uh, the argument is that this is just too complex for people to understand. Uh, 
uh, and it distracts attention away from uh, the underlying um, need to just conserve on uh, uh, consumer uh, food consumption. So wrapping up, I don't have any solution to these problems. So what's the point? Um, well, I, my point's kind of lame, uh, but it's simply this, that uh, philosophical discussions of food waste and its ethical dimensions really shouldn't neglect these complicating factors. Um, there can be negative impacts on some of the world's poorest people. Uh, and uh, these uh, discussions really need to come to grips with a, some of the larger structural issues in the food system uh, that have uh, reduced. Uh, this isn't exactly the same uh, circular economy that we were talking about earlier, but sort of the, the cycling of nutrients within an agricultural production system uh, and actually having uh, what would be a, a sustainable um, agricultural system. And with that, I will stop. Thank you, Paul. Okay, uh, we will now turn off the recording uh, and move.